Please welcome Celia Holmes Indahl, CEO, EQT Foundation. Mosun Leodi, Executive Director, African Philanthropy Forum. And moderator, David Bank, Editor and CEO, Impact Alpha. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here. We've worked with MIT Solve over the years. They've always been a tremendous source of, of innovation and talent. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to meeting all the, the new solvers. Uh, so please come up and introduce yourself if you can. Um, let's, uh, I, I think maybe some of you know about Impact Alpha. If you don't, uh, we're a media platform around impact investing and sustainable finance. And if you want to get a, a free uh, sampler of it, you, um, go to impactalpha.com slash open. And that's our free weekly newsletter. You get a little taste of what we do. Um, so many uh, uh, global leaders are in town this week, as you know, including our two uh, panelists. So let's jump, jump right in. Three words kept coming up in our conversations uh, beforehand. Um, uh, systems, trust, and entanglement. And uh, let's, let's take them in, in, in turn. Um, uh, uh, systematic uh, it requires a deep understanding of kind of the local context. And so I think if you can, I don't want you to have to summarize an entire continent, but uh, if you can give us a little bit of the, of the sense of the, of the systems context you operate in, in Africa and then also Europe. Jake. Yes. Hello, everyone. Really excited to be here. And in the midst of solvers, I heard, you know, when I was coming into the building, the first thing I heard was, are you a solver? I didn't even know there was such a word. So <laughs> super excited to be in the midst of solvers. Um, I run African Philanthropy Forum, and we're a network of philanthropists that are committed to driving change on the African continent and reducing our reliance on international aid, because a lot of the support that come to nonprofits and social enterprises in Africa are from the global north. And so we've been around for a while. And I'll just, um, just to give you a sense of what the, how the African philanthropy landscape has evolved over the years. We are naturally givers in Africa. We are communal people. We rally around each other in time of need. Um, but what we're, what, what we're not used to is being systemic or deliberate in the way that we give. And that's why where African Philanthropy Forum comes in, because we work with members of our network to be more strategic in their giving. And we've seen an evolution over the past couple of years, or, and not just because of the work of APF, but because of the evolving landscape. And we're seeing more foundations being set up, and we're seeing organizations moving from um, being just operating foundations to being open and willing to work in collaboration with others because the problems on the continent are enormous and it will be challenging for only one individual or one foundation to solve. So we have, we have um, an emergence of collaborative funds that are coming together where we find philanthropists and foundations pulling resources to solve some of the most pressing issues that we have. And of course, um, impact investing is also coming into the space, especially as we have next gen philanthropists coming up because they think very differently from their parents and they're exploring innovative and exciting ways of doing things and funding and um, work on the African continent. So it's um, a plethora of um, giving, I would say, approaches that we have on the African continent from grant making to impact investment and even to blended um, funding on the continent. Great, great. Celia? Yeah, I think a term that stuck to me when I was starting the foundation uh, of EKT, so EKT is a global private equity uh, investment company with 280 plus billion euros in asset and mention. It's a big investment firm investing across real estate, infrastructure, ventures, private companies, and having this purpose of going in and future-proofing companies for the future. So when we started the foundation, we asked ourselves, what are the areas where capital is not flowing, where we have the expertise to help? And we designed a foundation that can both invest from uh, a separate fund that doesn't come from EQT's investors' money, but where we can take on much more risk uh, supporting solvers like this, uh, because there is a bridge in capital funding before we get into the more conventional markets. And then uh, also, where can we support with grant funding? Uh, where to, to unlock some of these uh, systemic ways of bringing capital. But I think it's this move, um, when we first started it, somebody told me, 
you have to make sure that you're not only uh, throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping that it sticks. <laughs> Speaking to how many foundations we're just hoping, you know, like putting it out into a lot of nonprofits, not being very involved, but hoping that you know we're supporting good causes. So this is going to uh, create some impact on the ground. Uh, and now we're actually moving into more. I think w it's been called lasagna finance, <laughs> where you kind of stack capital on top of each other with a mission. Uh, and I think that's a great picture of what we're moving from and what we're moving to. Uh, and that's the way we're thinking now is, OK, how are we using our capital to come in to solve a, a system shift? And how is it working together with other types of capital? And how can philanthropies be part of de-risking uh, conventional investors coming in to solve some of these issues? And I think that was where we talked about, you know, my dream would really be to see more capital entanglement where capital comes in and it shares a bigger vision of what it's there to solve. And it kind of looks around like, OK, you're going in investing in real estate to solve this. I'm going in investing in infrastructure. OK, we need some innovation. We need somebody to go in and fund the solvers that will come into this ecosystem. And I think we're moving to that point. And I think that, to me, is really uh, a symptom that we're moving in the right direction. You, you jumped the gun on entanglement, but uh, <laughs> that's good to bring it in. But let's go to tr let's go to, to trust, um, and and you know there's a sort of uh, gap trust gap, let's just say, in in, in many institutions, in many in many um, uh, geographies. Um, to be clear, with sometimes with private equity, um, sometimes with with billionaires, uh, you know, with many of the people you work with, and then also with communities on the ground. And maybe you can each give us an example of how you've helped build trust and sort of where it's worked, maybe if you want, where it hasn't worked? Well, you know, so trust is a big, it, it is a big issue, especially for us on the African continent, because we find that there's a lot, a lot of um, concern about whether or not you're investing in an organization that exists, right? You know, so um, we just concluded, well, a couple of years ago, we conducted research with Britpan that um, showed that majority of funders are unable to give because they can't identify credible givers. And so we started a platform called Startpoint, which, is, which brings together um, organizations, whether nonprofits or social enterprises, that are working on the African continent that we have vetted you know, so that they can go to the platform and identify an organization and believe that these organizations would actually do what they say they would do. Um, that's one. Um, the other, just generally speaking, in the spaces, we continue to create spaces for conversations and for investors and philanthropists to come in contact with the doers and so that they can exchange and understand the work that they do and break down the barriers and the silos and trust issues. We actually have sessions where we say, we, we, um, we bring donors into the room that say, ask, ask a donor anything or um, what, the, what the NGOs want to know from a funder. You know, so it's just ensuring that we're creating those opportunities for them to connect, to share, and um, demystify you know, the, the, um, any issues that they have in between them. And also um, ensuring that you know, for, when, when funds, telling our stories, I think that's what I would say, telling stories of successful initiatives that have been backed and have been successful and they have scaled. I think sharing such also helps in terms of building trust in communities. Great. Great. I think when it comes to trust, what we're experiencing is, you know, when we started the foundation, a lot of people challenged us, do you really want to be investing? Isn't it just better to give them free money? And I'll turn to the solvers, <laughs> and I hope you agree with me that it's really important for you to have investors on your cap table with the experience from the investment industry saying, we're actually backing this, and we're putting all our resources, and we bet on this. So we're, what we like to say is that we have skin in the game of, of making this work. Uh, but we do invest in a philanthropic way where we take smaller strategic tickets and then we bring in the same amount of resources as if we had a higher equity stake. Because this leaves plenty of room on the cap table for other investors to come in and then we can be part of de-risking the solver or the startup for more uh, funders to come in. And I think you also want to build trust in the equity narrative of the startup. 
And I think this is specifically important to get right for all the solvers. And I'm happy to discuss or chat with you later today after your pitches. But how are we telling the story that this is something that's going to be funded and scaled, knowing the new type of capital instruments that are coming in for uh, impact, uh, both on the project financing side, but you know, different types of, of debt funding, et cetera. Um, we see some startups that's really made it big, like Zipline, that just reached their 1 million drone deliveries uh, of blood uh, or medical supplies, uh, mostly also uh, working in Africa. And I think it's great to see, but you know, one of their biggest customers is the government of Rwanda. So, so what is the, you know, what are the new equity narrative of these companies that will make the, or provide a atmosphere that the capital providers can kind of stack up against and be ready to fund it as it scales? I think we're looking at how can we unlock that at each place by creating trust in the, the equity narrative. Right, right. Let's let's stick with you because you, and you you were the the source of entanglement, and and you've gotten into a little bit. But there's different levels of capital, and EQT, as folks m probably know, is one of the largest private equity companies in the world. You're the foundation, but you're also doing investing. So how do you think about what goes in what bucket, and how to and how to make it all fit together? So I think our investment thesis is really based on the areas where our colleagues in the investment on the investment side of of EQT felt, you know. We really, we really want this to work. We really want to invest in this. But uh, our clients or pension funds and fiduciary responsibilities uh, doesn't stretch into the seed market. Like it, the, we didn't have the investment mandates. And then we asked ourselves, how would it look if we could pull our resources and invest in the really early stages where some of the biggest funding gaps are? Uh, and in the sectors, where the time horizons often are longer. So we know on, on climate innovation or cl new climate technologies, they need to be, build these massive plants to get to scale in meaningful uh, CO2 removals. Uh, and there's a lot of capital needing to get to that size. And how can we help them connect them through one of EQT's 300 portfolio companies as first customers to accelerate the time it takes to, to get to that size? And on the healthcare side, we also see, you know, getting through clinical trials. We have uh, then we match uh, startups and founders together with healthcare uh, portfolio companies that are going through the same clinical trials that knows the local markets, etc. So that you also can fast forward a little of the process to scale. Great, great. And Mosun, similar question, but your African philanthropy forum is kind of at the forefront of this trend of, of African capital for African challenges. And it's tr true in philanthropy. It's also happening, I think, with pension funds and institutional investors, insurance companies. So how do you think about how your, your members and your, and your kind of capital fits in the whole stack of, of, of what's needed? Yeah, you know, so our members are mainly traditional givers, not necessarily impact. Um, impact investors, but there are some that are um, investing in this space as well. So I think it's understanding you know, their appetite and what fits who, um, you know, what the philanthropists are open to supporting and funding. And so we have um, a variety of members of our network that are um, supporting different initiatives. So for instance, we would have like uh, Motsepe Foundation partnering with the Milken Institute and their, um, their partnership, I think, I believe, has gone into the third round. They've supported um, initiatives on the continent in agri-tech, they've supported in fintech, um, they've supported, I, I think, green energy. Um, we have Harambi that um, decided to take a systems change lens to solving problems in South Africa where um, they decided to um, address the youth unemployment issue in South Africa, and they've scaled enough to even work with the government of Rwanda. Um, I believe Rwanda is one of the most progressive when it comes to advancing some of these initiatives on the African continent. Um, and you know, we also have Faith Foundation, which is very interesting in Nigeria, because they started out training nonprofit organizations, um, sorry, not, not nonprofits, ent entrepreneurs on how to build sustainable businesses, and they have partnered with the government of Netherlands, I, I think they pulled together 1.5 million, million euros, and they supported about um, 800 or 700 entrepreneurs, youth-led um, businesses that have generated about 700 jobs and 6 million euros. 
um, in revenue. So I think it's finding the risk appetite of members of our network and challenging them to support the initiatives that are doing great work on the right. African continent. Right. Um, the, the other uh, word that always comes up is scale. And uh, 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 we're running down on time, but if you had an example of something that started small and has now gotten big that you've, you've played some role in. So we had a founder who came to us with a theory that they could make trees grow faster and uh, capture more carbon. And we looked at each other and we're like, this sounds kind of crazy. Uh, and we, <laughs> we went to our advisors, so EKT has a big network of, of experts and, and scientists, and they came back to us and said, in theory, this is, this is supposed to be possible. And we're like, OK, let's, let's bet on it. You know, we did our due diligence. We went in. Three months later, they'd proven that they could grow trees 40% faster and capture double the amount of, of CO2. Uh, and it was led in an internal up round of all the investors backing the initiative. Uh, we later uh, introduced the founder uh, through our infrastructure investment colleagues in the US to a landowner that secured their first big contract of planting four million trees. And I think that was such a, you know, a moment where we're like, this is why we're doing this. Uh, and seeing that that actually is, is coming to scale is, is super cool to see. Great, great. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just stick to Faith Foundation because I think we're at zero. Um, yeah, because that was an incredible story from how they started as a nonprofit, um, training entrepreneurs and then moving to investing in them and growing, creating jobs. And if you know, one of the biggest challenges on the African continent is employment. Um, and when they're creating employment and also generating revenue, it's interesting to see how far they would go in the coming years. Great. And let me just borrow a little bit of a, a moment and, and, and a, a trick from our predecessor panel and, and give you a chance for a hashtag or, or one takeaway, one word, uh, one, one pearl of wisdom that you want to leave people with. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, from my panel yesterday, I'll just say what I said that my panel yesterday, stop talking, start doing. Great. <laughs> That's a great one. I'll, I'll say capital entanglement. I think we need this time in, uh, like this moment in time when we all align capital to do good and we kind of connect around missions. Uh, so moving to that. Great. And with that, we will stop talking. Uh, so uh, thank you both and thank you all for having us. Thank you.